have seen throughout history, females recognized as geniuses have been few and far between. Moreover, as we'll now explore, even when women did accomplish extraordinary things, they were often denied what they had fairly earned. Let's meet just a couple of these geniuses denied. We'll start with ancient Egypt. According to Egyptologist Pharaoh Hatshepsut, is known as the first great woman in history, of whom we are informed. The first great woman in history. Why then the beard? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. In other words, Hatshepsut is thought to be the first woman about whom we know enough to be able to write a history. Hatshepsut ruled in Egypt for 20 years, as you can see by the dates on the screen. So much statuary was produced during her reign that nearly every major museum in the world today has had Shepsutian monuments in its collection. Yet immediately after her death, an attempt was made to systematically remove Hatshepsut from history. Statutes of her were destroyed and inscriptions about her were defaced. Hatshepsut was both written and broken out of history. Her crime, well, she had made herself pharaoh, king, rather than serving in the more traditional role of queen regent. Implicit hostility to the notion of a female ruler can be seen in the masculine beard that it was thought necessary to add to her face. Not until the 1920s did archaeologists find and restore many of the once vandalized Hatshepsutian monuments. Today, Hatshepsut can be seen in all her masculine splendor, among other places in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. But back in the day, even wearing a fake beard was not enough to save a woman's glory from destruction. Let's jump to the 17th century and to the Baroque era in art and to the woman now known as the hashtag MeToo painter. Artemisia Gentileschi. As a teenager in Rome, Gentileschi had been a victim of sexual assault, raped by her teacher, Augustino Tassi. The case went to trial, and Gentileschi was subjected to physical torture, presumably to get her to recant her accusation. The assailant, Tassi, was convicted, but served no sentence. The victim, Gentileschi, was branded a woman of lost virtue. For decades thereafter, Gentileschi painted acts of sexual aggression, or at least her feelings about sexual aggression. Foremost among these is her treatment of the story of Judith beheading Holofernes as an act of retribution for a sexual assault. This story, Gentileschi painted at least five times. What you see is the version surviving today in Naples. For centuries thereafter, some of Gentileschi's paintings were attributed to male artists, to Gentileschi's own father, Orazio, and to another painter named Bernardo Cavallino. Apparently, art patrons, the buyers of the day, could not believe that paintings of such technical bravura and passionate intensity could be the work of a woman. Or maybe the paintings were thought to be worth less if painted by a woman, and thus they were ascribed to a man. Skipping to the 20th century, in recent years, the world has been brought to its knees by a pandemic wrought by the COVID-19 virus. Assuming that genius can be equated with significance of impact and the number of people impacted, the vaccines against COVID-19 are recent acts of genius. Hundreds of millions of people around the world have been vaccinated and millions of lives saved. Two of the most effective vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, are based on the science of restructuring DNA. We'll return to that bit of this science in our next session when we discuss the genius of the team. Who discovered DNA? Well, that doesn't matter so much as the question of who discovered the structure of DNA, because that discovery opened the entire field of bioengineering, the genome, gene sequencing, gene engineering etc. Usually, we say that James Watson and Francis Crick, well, they discovered the structure of DNA at Cambridge University in 1953. 
but the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the structure of DNA actually was awarded to three people, Watson, Crick, and Maurice Wilkins. Watson and Crick were molecular biochemists. Wilkins was a crystallographer, someone who makes images of microscopic structures. But the person who actually knew how to take and did take the decisive photograph revealing the structure of DNA, the famous photograph 51, was, as you likely know, Rosalind Franklin, whom you see on the screen. Why didn't Franklin win the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology? For two reasons. One, her male colleague, James Watson, facilitated the expropriation, theft if you will, of Franklin's photograph without her permission and demeaned her contribution. And two, because Franklin was a victim of bad luck. Bad luck. The statutes of the Nobel Foundation, Section 4, Paragraph 2, read, Work produced by a person deceased shall not be considered for an award. Franklin had died of ovarian cancer four years before the Nobel Committee turned to DNA and made its award. Fame and glory again denied. The discovery of the structure of DNA is generally ranked among the top three in biomedical history. We all know the names Watson and Crick, but it was really Watson, Crick, and Franklin. Who invented the atomic bomb? Remember, a genius might be defined as someone who changes society for good or for ill. Atomic power, atomic bomb, for good or for ill. But almost any answer to the question, which scientists invented the atomic bomb, will include the name Lise Meitner. And almost any internet search of the words scientific recognition stolen from women will include, right after Rosalind Franklin, again the name Lise Meitner. In 1938, Meitner discovered the process of nuclear fission, working with her colleague Otto Hahn. And from nuclear fission, several years later, in fact, specifically 1945, came the atomic bomb. In 1945, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Nuclear Fission was awarded not to Meitner, but to her collaborator, Otto Hahn, alone. Failure to recognize a woman's contribution to scientific research has been so frequent that it has come to be called the Matilda Effect. Recognized in print as early as 1870 and then given a name, as you can see in 1993, by Margaret Rossiter. Lise Meitner seems to have been a victim of the Matilda effect. She was nominated a total of 48 times for a Nobel Prize, 48 times, but not one was ever awarded to her. Marie Curie is the only person, male or female, to have been awarded Nobel Prizes in two scientific fields, first in physics in 1903 and in chemistry in 1911. The first was awarded because her husband, Pierre Curie, knowing that Marie was the driving force behind the discovery of radium, insisted that she share the prize with him and their colleague, Henri Becquerel. But even then, the general public seems to have thought, or been led to think, that a woman's contribution in the sciences could only be of secondary importance. Let me try to make the point by showing you a photograph of what was really going on and Marie Curie's lab, set next to an illustration created in 1903 to celebrate the awarding of the Nobel Prize for the discovery of radium. The photograph on the left in Marie Curie's lab shows her at work with Henri Becquerel and Pierre Curie looking on. The illustration on the right, a recreation of that photograph, places Becquerel and Pierre up front doing the touching and Marie behind, just looking on. The illustrator here is André Castaigne, who fashioned magazine and book illustrations in France around 1900. Castaigne also created the cover of the first edition of the Fan of the Opera. Here on the left, we see Castaigne's imaginative version of the discovery of radium and on the right, the cover of Phantom. The point is, again, that in the translation, or transition, if you will, from historical photograph 
to public illustration, the woman has been marginalized and Marie Curie suffered the Matilda effect more than this time, more than just this once. Consider this photograph on the left, taken again in Marie Curie's lab about 1904. Note the hook on the wall and the stove in the background. Marie is at work and Pierre, dressed in a business suit, looks on. Now consider how that same photograph was represented in an illustration in a newspaper of the day. Same hook, same stove, but now it is Marie who looks on while Pierre, this time dressed in a lab coat, does the work, holding a beaker, presumably a basset. Finally, notice how this same scene was transformed for Vanity Fair magazine in 1904. Pierre holds a book and a shining bit of radioactive radium. Marie is again relegated to a secondary position, her hand placed supportively on his shoulder. Why this rewriting or redrawing, if you will, of history? at the turn of the 20th century. The public apparently was not ready to accept the fact that a woman was capable of a major scientific discovery. Eventually, really by the 1920s and certainly after Marie Curie had won yet a second Nobel Prize, the importance of Madame Curie as a driving force behind the discovery of radium was evident to all the world and even to Hollywood where she became the heroine of motion pictures. And still today, films about Marie Curie hold the public imagination, while figures such as Pierre Curie and Henri Becquerel have faded into the background or even disappeared. She is now the doer. She holds the radioactive substance. Now a last example of a woman denied credit. This one, I think, a fun one from the world of art. In 1986, Margaret Keane, the creator of the Big Eyes style of art in mid-century California, sued her husband Walter. Walter had served as Margaret's agent and manager, but Walter was also claiming that he, not she, was the creative artist. When the dispute went to trial in San Francisco court, the judge ordered a paint-off to determine who was the real artist. Both Margaret and Walter would create Big Eyes paintings in the courtroom. Walter declined, citing a sore shoulder, whereas Margaret completed her painting in 53 minutes. She was awarded $4 million, but the judgment was overturned in 1990, and Margaret got no money at all. And while we're on the subject of money, most likely, we'd all agree that money is not genius. It's simply a placeholding mechanism represented by a symbol like a dollar for, that can be exchanged at some later date for labor and materials that, once in the right hands, can be unleashed to change the world. But as we all know with regard to money, women historically had far less of it. Laws of ownership and property worked in favor of sons, not daughters. And when women were allowed to work outside the home, they were paid less. When the now famous codebreaker Elizabeth Friedman and her husband William, for example, went to work for the U.S. government in Washington in 1921, she was paid just about half of what he got, although she was equally experienced in the science of codebreaking. Pay inequality has lessened in the West since 1921, but women of all races still earn less than their male counterparts. Although the gap has been narrowing, the push to pay equality has now stalled. So, maybe as important as a room of one's own, to reference again Virginia Woolf, is a bank account of one's own. Money can be a measure of respect and self-esteem, and it can be a temporary placeholder for opportunity. No money, no opportunity to build out your idea or to build out your fledgling company that will promote your vision of the future. What percentage of venture capital money in the United States, according to the most recent statistics of 2019, would you imagine went to female-led businesses? 3%. So in some ways, things are changing about the perception of women as potential geniuses, and in some ways, perceptions are not changing. 
Sometimes, blind spot bias against girls is held even by modern-day parents, progressive mothers and fathers, and is reflective in their subconscious perception of their own daughters. To make the point, a recent article in the New York Times, Google Tell Me, Is My Son a Genius?, pointed out that parents today are two-point times more likely to ask online, Is My Son Gifted?, than is my daughter gifted? And similarly, twice as likely to inquire, is my daughter overweight as they are for a son? Thus, judging from this, even today, the prejudice ratio against gifted females is 2.5 to 1. But let's hear from someone who has been thinking about and living these issues all of her professional life. Let's welcome our guest.